Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Baker, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Addiction Recovery Channel, otherwise known as ARC. For those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, ARC is a TV station that is devoted to raising public consciousness specifically regarding substance use disorder. The idea being that if the general public has accurate information, they are likely to approach this particular population with substance use disorder with compassion. Um, and we will actually be saving lives. So today, it's my pleasure and my honor to uh, welcome Dr. John uh, Brooklyn to my show. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, John. Thanks Thank for you. having me, yeah. Thank you for being here. Welcome. I'd like to begin with uh, a couple of statements about uh, Dr. Brooklyn's uh, career and his history. Dr. Brooklyn was uh, licensed as a physician in Vermont in 1992. He was uh, board certified as an addiction um, uh, medicine physician by the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 1996. And he has been an innovator and a researcher in the treatment of opioid uh, use disorder since the mid 90s, specifically uh, leading uh, Vermont's innovative uh, buprenorphine program since 2002. Now, you don't find many people around who, who have that kind of distinguished career for that long a period of time, and that is what drives my first question to Dr. Brooklyn. John, I'd like you to give the audience a general perspective on what you've seen. You've been here since the beginning of the opioid epidemic, and, and you're still here now. So what, 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 have, what have been your observations? How, how has this happened? So when I came here in 1989 to do my residency, I had been trained at Brown University on substance use disorders or addiction as a disease that's treatable. And so from my perspective, it wasn't anything unique or special to see people who were using alcohol or injecting heroin as a medical student. So when I came to Vermont, it just seemed like another disease to treat like diabetes or high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So when I finished my residency, actually during my residency, I was asked to do some trainings for the other residents and even some of the attendings. And it became apparent pretty quickly that there was zero treatment for people who were heroin users, we'll say, at the time. And so when a job at the university opened up in the research wing, uh, I took it. And so for many years, anybody who was a heroin user, the only treatment available in Vermont was through our buprenorphine studies at UVM. And so I feel like I got to see the majority of individuals who were struggling with this. And we would have 50, 100, 120 people in, a, in, a, in different studies. And it wasn't until about 1998, mm -hmm. 99, that we began to see a change from just heroin use to pill use. And predominantly, it was OxyContin, mm -hmm. uh, the long-acting oxycodone. And it, primarily, that was because it was being widely prescribed. So there was a shift from injection heroin use to pill use. And then in the early aughts, still a fair amount of pill use, but heroin became stronger, and suddenly we began to see people who were no longer injecting it, but were sniffing it. Mm -hmm. So you went away from people who maybe would have never used heroin because they had to inject it, now looking at it as something that they could use because they could use it in a less uh, difficult form by, mm -hmm. by sniffing it. Mm -hmm. And when our first treatment facility opened in 2002, the Howard Center's Chittenden Clinic, um, we took people from who were traveling out of state because I don't know if, if you were aware, if the viewers were aware that in Vermont, in order to get any kind of methadone treatment, which is another treatment for, for heroin users, you had to ride three hours each way right. to a program either in Greenfield, Massachusetts or Nashua, New Hampshire or even Albany. And so people would get on a bus at 2, 3 o'clock or a limousine 3 o'clock in the morning, show up at the clinic at 6, get a dose, turn around and come home. So every day, every day until they were given some take homes and, and they wouldn't have to travel every day. But predominantly when the clinic first opened, the first cohort we took were those travelers. Mm -hmm. And so then we had a waiting list from the very first day we opened that program. 
And what happened is that over time, as people realized that there was now methadone treatment, they began to call and call and call, and we had quite a number of people in treatment. At the same time, buprenorphine became available in 2003. So all the studies that we did at UVM helped pave the way for the FDA to approve it. And so you then had a lot of physicians in the state who understood about buprenorphine because some of their patients had been in our studies. They were agreeable to learning about how to prescribe buprenorphine and began to prescribe it. So you saw zero treatment for about 12, 10 to 12 years, and then suddenly treatment which was available, but waiting lists everywhere, mm -hmm and treatment demand because more and more people were looking for treatment because there was more availability of prescription opioids, heroin didn't have to be injected, and it became more and more of a problem. I think when you talk about the current day situation, what's really been a game changer is the uh, advent of the synthetic opioids mm -hmm. such as fentanyl and carfentanyl, which are very, very potent. And so previously someone may inject a large amount of heroin but not overdose and die, and now you have people injecting one or two doses of white powder that they think is heroin, and it's fatal. So I think what you've seen over time is the evolution into just that much more of a potent substance that we have to be even more thoughtful and careful about trying to make sure that there's treatment for everybody, um, which we've now achieved in Vermont, as we were talking about earlier. Well, why do you think, why do you think it is that the, 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 the number of people with opioid use disorder grew so rapidly? That's a great question because for decades the mm -hmm. feds thought there were sort of on any given day about a million uses of heroin in the United States and that number remained fairly constant partially because unfortunately people would pass on uh, from using heroin and new people would come and use but I think the game changer was the prescription pills because if you think about it if you're a person who would be unwilling to inject a bag of powder, right. but you got a pill that the FDA had stamped yeah. saying mm -hmm. this amount of medication is in this pill and it came from a physician or it came from a pharmacy, mm -hmm. there's more legitimacy to that. So I think people had this sense that it was a safer substance to it, use. It has a low addiction potential. Or, or mm -hmm. not only that, but they were less likely to have harmful effects because mm -hmm. it wasn't cut with anything. Mm -hmm. You knew the potency. You could stratify the amount you used. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a consistent product. And I think what happened is that as people experiment, uh, it leads to more and more experimentation. More pills are out there. More teenagers get a hold of pills, parties, whatever. And so you just have a rising tide of individuals who were exposed. Yeah. Yeah. And now you've got maybe four, five, six million individuals in the United States who are dependent on prescriptions versus heroin. So the numbers tripled or quadrupled in terms of the total number of people who were opiate users. And then there's, there's also, I think, data that shows that around 1990 forward, people with heroin use disorder, their first opioid of use was a prescription opioid rather than heroin. They began with a pharmaceutical opioid, illicitly obtained, mm -hmm. and then later on switched over to heroin, presumably because the heroin marketers began you know, infiltrating the area mm -hmm. with high-grade, low-cost heroin. But tell me if this is one of your observations. This is one of my observations from my, from my private practice. This happened many times. I would get a, usually a male, you know, between 20 and 30 years old in my office who is either uh, injecting heroin or, you know, has an opioid use disorder with prescription opioids. You take a history and find out what happened with them. And I can't tell you how many times it was because of pain mm -hmm. that was generated from hard work. You know how we have a lot of young mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. they do uh, landscaping, mm -hmm. mowing, mm -hmm. just the construction. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people in that industry in Vermont. I cannot tell you how many people I've had in my office who were introduced to uh, an opioid by a coworker to deal with pain, mm -hmm. and that inevitably uh, led to full-blown opioid use disorder. Have you seen that? Absolutely. In fact, I think when Dr. Chen was our commissioner, he was very wise in trying to identify the fact that most people actually started with a legitimate prescription, mm -hmm. whereby you went to the emergency room or you went to your doctor and you had an injury, back injury, leg mm -hmm. injury, or you had an orthopedic injury, and you were prescribed. And you were prescribed 
much too long mm -hmm. to the point where you became physically dependent. Mm -hmm. And then the docs erroneously believe that you would have suffered no symptoms of withdrawal if you stopped abruptly. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. we know what happens when you stop opioids abruptly after mm -hmm. a couple weeks, and then you're out looking for pills. Mm -hmm. And the pills are more costly, mm -hmm. and next thing you know, the dealers are around with low-cost heroin. So if you start off with Percocet or Oxycodone, and then you progress to the long-acting Oxycontin, it was going for a dollar, dollar twenty-five a milligram. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you're using 160 milligrams of Oxycontin a day, yeah. You're not going to make that it's money working. pumping mm -hmm. gas mm -hmm. or mowing lawns, mm -hmm. and ne next thing you know, beg, borrow, and steal, heroin's around the corner. $10, $15 for a dose, and next thing you know, it's the low-cost option. So that's exactly how mm -hmm. I would say most people, mm -hmm. even today, mm -hmm. I still encounter people when I'm doing intakes. You know, they were on these medicines 10 years, 5 years. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, it led to mm -hmm. a situation where heroin entered, and it's you know, quite. In fact, the other thing, just to point this out, is that one could argue that one of the reasons there was a rise in, in opiate use, and this may be a little controversial, is that when you raised the drinking age to 21 and you made it harder for people to obtain alcohol, mm -hmm. there was no difficulty finding opioids or heroin because mm -hmm. you weren't going to get carded anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we mm -hmm. know that for many, many years, alcohol use disorder was the predominant. In fact, we used to say opiate, use disorder, opiate users are just a tributary in a sea of alcohol use. Mm -hmm. That's really changed. I think two or three years ago, we saw for the first time a decrease in admissions for alcohol and an increase in opioid mm -hmm. admissions that finally overcame the admissions for alcohol. So mm -hmm. one could mm -hmm. argue that there was an unintended consequence by restricting access to alcohol that led, because let's face it, our brains are wired for novelty, mm -hmm. right? We want to do something that's fun and exciting, mm -hmm. and if it's going to be a substance and you can't find this substance, well, let me try that mm -hmm. substance. Mm -hmm. how, how harmful can it be? It comes mm -hmm. in a pill form, and I'm just going to snort mm -hmm. it. And then there's a certain uh, percentage of the population that tries one substance or another, maybe opioids in this case, who have inner pain. Yeah. Oh. They have psychological mm -hmm. pain, mm -hmm. they have emotional pain, they have post-traumatic stress. We call it uh, adverse childhood experiences. Somehow their brain is wired and their emotions are wired to respond in a way to psychoactive chemicals that's kind of outside the normal response. They want it more. They think about it more. It relieves inner pain so they're more driven to, to seek it, which eventually leads to addiction. But you mentioned something really interesting. You know, it, it's the, the, the behavior of people with substance use disorder or opioid use disorder in particular that, you know, seeking the drug, obtaining the drug, injecting the drug, maybe in fact acquiring money to purchase the drug in ways that they wouldn't normally do. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how does a, a person who may be brought up, you know, with a, with a, a really, um, you know, a sterling value system, under the influence of addiction, behave in ways that are outside their value system. What is that? How does the brain operate where it enables that kind of behavior? How do people do that? So, as I think about it, it's rare for me to ever meet anybody that says, I've always wanted to be a heroin user. Mm -hmm. Right? When mm -hmm. I was 10 years old, I didn't wake up one day and say, by golly, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and so people, I think, are constantly upset at themselves for how they got there. And, and let's not be mistaken, a lot of people who are using opiates started legitimately. Mm -hmm. They were prescribed. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, it filled a void, as you say, and they couldn't stop. So part of what we have to recognize is that in the wiring of the brain, we have a pleasure system, and that pleasure system responds to some kind of thing that makes us feel like we've been rewarded. For some people, it's doing well on an exam. For mm -hmm. some people, it's winning a race. For some people, it's jumping out of an airplane. And for some people, mm -hmm. it's some kind of substance that they have to take because for whatever reason, their reward system has either been hijacked or maybe had some abnormalities to begin with. Maybe there's a genetic component because mm -hmm. that does exist in some cases. And mm -hmm. so when you have that kind of situation where your normal thinking gets hijacked, because we're talking about chemicals in the brain, mm -hmm. it's pretty potent. So in the case of opioids, we have many places in the brain where a chemical called an endorphin, which is an opiate-like, it's an opioid peptide, go, and that purpose is to relieve pain and stress. Mm -hmm. 
and it's tied in to our sympathetic nervous system. So for instance, if you have something traumatic happen, <clears throat> let's, say, let's say you drop something on your foot and it really hurts, mm -hmm. you're most likely going to release some dopamine to help you through that so that you can at least deal with it for a short period of time and then you, you get better. But if it was more significant for that, or you had a difficulty in the way that you released endorphins, you may continuously release that adrenaline as a stress response. Mm -hmm. And if your way of dealing with that stress response is not as functional as it could be, you may seek out substances mm -hmm. which reduce the amount of adrenaline that you make so you don't feel so anxious. Okay, sure. And yeah. so when you talk about people with any kind of substance use disorder, we like to use the word trauma-informed. And when you look at data, you look at people that come in so much of what is at the basis of how people choose to use substances is something happened, something traumatic, in many cases 60, 70, 80 percent of the time, that caused the front part of the, the brain, the sensing part called the amygdala, where all these memories are stored, to be activated in a way that has a negative, negative connotation for the person where they're trying to avoid something. And so by taking opioids, you downregulate that adrenaline, you don't make as much adrenaline, and you feel calmer. Cocaine will do the same thing. Alcohol will do the same thing. So if you're not able to, on your own, release the chemicals that you need, you may discover that by taking a substance, you can feel better. And so you kind of hijack your normal way mm -hmm. of coping. Mm -hmm. And so people find themselves in distress. Someone dies, they get divorced, they lose a job, and someone says, oh, here, try this, snort this, and they like it, and they keep doing it, because at that moment, they were vulnerable. Right. <clears throat> Even well-meaning folks who will, whatever, they're vulnerable, and they start to use it, and because of the nature of receptors in the brain, when you start taking some of these drugs to which there's a receptor, you can become physically dependent. And so, by being physically dependent, you take it all the time, and then when you don't take it, what happens? You go into withdrawal. You go into withdrawal. And what happens when you're in withdrawal? You release all this adrenaline. So what mm. happens when you release adrenaline? And you're motivated to seek the drug. You sweat, you're anxious, mm. you're, you're uptight, your belly hurts, and exactly. You take the drug and the problem goes away. So I think research will say that most people keep using because they don't want to be sick. Mm. And when they finally recognize they're having difficulty, there's shame and there's guilt and there's resentment and all the things that you wouldn't expect a person to feel, mm -hmm. they say, how the heck did I end up here? Right. And there's that self-loathing that occurs. So, so there's, there's that part then. There's the, the person with addiction being driven to seek the drug because of withdrawal or stress. And then there's that part of the person that's still there, yes. the value system that says no, mm -hmm. you know, you're in therapy mm -hmm. or you've promised your loved one you're not going to do that anymore or you, you're about to get fired from your job or that's behavior that you just never wanted to engage in. So while the person is driven toward a behavior, they're also resisting the same behavior what is it about people with substance use disorder where that ability to resist fails them and they, they can't, they may want with every cell in their body to not engage in taking that drug, but yet they go ahead and do it anyway? It's a great question. And what I would say is, let's take heroin, for instance. Mm. The, the unique thing about heroin, as opposed to, say, taking pills, is that Heroin mm. is a substance, the way it's manufactured, the chemical structure that it gets into your brain when you inject it in about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, which sort of protects our brains from different drugs. We have a barrier, and it gets in there in 10 seconds. And what it does is it flicks that part of the brain on where those receptors are very quickly on, mm -hmm. but it doesn't stay there very long, and then it turns off. So when you use heroin long enough, you begin to change the way that that cell is actually coded to operate. Mm -hmm. So that instead of being a cell that can tolerate some stress, without the opiate being present, you feel edgy, irritable, anxious, weeks or months mm -hmm. after you stop using heroin. And we believe, based on human models, animal models, genetic studies, that the cells change fundamentally in some cases permanently. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a, there's a big recognition that heroin use can become a chronic brain condition that despite your best intentions, mm -hmm. your promises, everything you've done, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your brain has changed in such a way that you just can't live without it because you're on edge, you're irritable, and then you take the drug and you feel well again. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that in many ways informs our belief that this is methadone, which is an opioid replacement or buprenorphine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. could be for some people a lifelong treatment. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But we don't argue that about thyroid replacement or insulin replacement. We're like, yeah, but it's the same thing operating. And I think part of my work has been to try to normalize this mm -hmm. as a process that's treatable, but it may be long-term treatment mm -hmm. despite the person's. And so what happens is that people who come on to methadone or come on to buprenorphine, and you know, let's face it, not everybody does well in any kind of medical treatment, but people who do well, they stop having the cravings. They stop mm -hmm. having that, and they begin to function in a way mm -hmm. that they restore themselves to their previous state of being, and they feel like they're in recovery, and they do re activities, and they become normalized in a way. And then if they mm -hmm. want to wean off because they think they've been good for 20 years, maybe they are. Mm -hmm. Maybe they sprain an ankle in a basketball game, and some ER doc gives them a pill or two, and they're off and running again because their brain's been recharged. So I think the point is that it's long-term changes that often occur that's very frustrating for people because if I'm your partner, sure, and I'm sure. like, listen, you've, sure. you know, mm -hmm. you've been da 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 da, and you're like, oh, I don't want to use, I don't want to use, and you do. Mm -hmm. How do you get around the being angry mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. blaming the person for mm -hmm. something that may be a biologic change? And and that's <laughs> that's really that's really the point that it's it's not a choice. Given the choice, nobody chooses. I'm going to grow up and be an addict. That it's, it's a brain disease. It's a powerful brain disease. And it's a chronic disease. It can last a lifetime, but also it responds really very favorably to the correct treatment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes medication, all the time psychotherapeutic supports, mm -hmm. and all the time adequate recovery services. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know many, many people who have been in recovery for many, many years. And, and I've known people who have relapsed and gotten back into recovery. So when we have this kind of approach, then our response as a public is compassion, inclusion, vote for the people that are going to put money into the programs to provide adequate services to help these people. If we don't have adequate information, then the, the, the normal response <clears throat> is, as you say, <clears throat> punitive, mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. I'm going to modify your behavior. I'm going to punish you until you stop. Right. Which we know doesn't work. Well, every now and then it does. Every right? now and Some then it might. Some people sit behind bars and like, okay, I'm never going to do this again, and they never do it again, but maybe they were lucky to have that kind of a brain that right. allowed them to the never most, do it again, right? You know, you for can't. the most part, it doesn't work. Right. Right. Exactly. There's exceptions to everything. Right. But the, other thing, but the other thing I just wanted to mm -hmm. say in response to that is I think what happens, and we talked about this earlier, is that it's really hard for people to feel self-compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, I often feel as though you have to give yourself credit for what you're going through because every time you think or you have a craving or even use, we try to get away from pejorative language. We try mm -hmm. to get away from saying, I'm clean, I'm dirty. Absolutely. It's like I used and it, I have a positive result. I had a craving, I acted on it, but mm -hmm. not to, because sometimes people who have the disease can be the worst critics. Absolutely. The language that's used and the way that they feel about themselves doesn't lend to recovery because they're like beating themselves up. How can you really do well if you're always thinking you're a bad person just Absolutely. because you, had a, you made a mistake? Absolutely. I mean, every time I drop a cup of tea, I don't think I'm like the worst person. Well, I just sweep it up and move on to the next and, cup of tea. And, and isn't, isn't that really the, the point of consciousness raising and positive uh, messaging, speaking about addiction, about substance use disorder in medical terms? rather than punitive terms. Because people, people with disorder, this disorder, they will internalize the stigma that's placed on them by the general public. So if the general public is saying, we care about you, mm -hmm. we care about you enough to have adequate services for you. Okay, you've relapsed, let's try again, let's use it as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. That person will begin to internalize that. Right. That's the wonderful thing about everything that that you and other leaders in this field are doing. It's like a cultural shift that has to happen now. And 
we owe it. We owe it to the people who have been taken by the disease. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who shed the light on the gravity of this and have motivated us all to finally, to finally do something about it. And I know, I know how deeply you care about the population. So I wanted to ask you, you've been a, a leader, you've been an innovator in uh, medication-assisted treatment. You've succeeded in, uh, in Vermont, basically the first methadone uh, treatment program, the mm -hmm. first buprenorphine treatment program. Your model is, uh, there are people all over the United States looking at your model, wanting to replicate The hub-and-spoke model. The hub-and-spoke yeah. mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. all over America. What do, what do you see as being next? Is it injectable uh, buprenorphine? Is it uh, safe injection facilities? What's, what's the, we're obviously trying our best, but the fatalities are still rising. So what, what, what is next? What do we do next? <clears throat> so if you think about, let's talk about the worst case scenario, overdose and fatalities. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a family practice doctor. I have patients who, despite my best efforts, continue to have heart attacks and die. Mm -hmm. People who, despite my best efforts, don't take their diabetes medicines and lose a leg. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that just because treatment's available doesn't mean everybody wants to do it because getting up every day, getting dressed, going to the clinic, going to the doctor's office, for some people it's work and, and for some people it's easier mm -hmm. on some level to just get the drug delivered to their home and use. So how do you motivate individuals to say treatment, how, how, low, can, how, how low can the barrier be mm -hmm. so that there's no barrier to getting care? Okay. Okay, so if we start there, you could say, all right, we have 1.6% of, of Vermonters over the age of 18 on medication-assisted treatment, which is the greatest number in the United States per capita. What's the actual number in Vermont? We have about 8,000 people right now on either methadone or buprenorphine okay. out of about 500,000 people over the age of 18. Okay. When you think about that and you say, okay, let's say that's 30, 40% of everybody and that there are maybe 20, 30, 40% of people using. Who right. have opiate use disorder on some level. And you know, it can be as low as 10 years old to 90 years old. We shouldn't kid ourselves that there's a certain segment yeah. of society that yeah. uses because there's a lot of older people who are maintained by you know, uh, opioids that are mm -hmm. probably having difficulty with it. But let's just say we need, to, we need to make sure we have enough capacity. So from my perspective, the infrastructure's in place. We've got enough doctors prescribing buprenorphine. We've got enough doctors wavered. We've got enough hubs, but we don't have the necessarily the workforce. We don't have enough people who can be licensed alcohol and drug counselors, masters in social work, RNs, to sort of fill the roles of the what we call the MAT teams that help the docs sure. in the team-based approach. So that's an issue. And I think Governor Scott has talked a little bit about how do we increase the workforce. Mm -hmm. We're training all docs, all family medicine doctors, and I think almost all internal medicine doctors who go through UVM residency programs are being wavered in how to prescribe. So you're building the next wave of people who can take this on. Great. I think that the criminal justice system is an area we really need to focus on because if we could eliminate the thought that you are a drug user and you are committing a crime, mm -hmm. we perhaps can redirect resources to getting more people into treatment. Um, we're, we're now anybody who's incarcerated who's on MAT continues for up to 90 days while incarcerated which is a big change and I think um, the concept of a safe injecting site and looking at the, the risk factors that exist for people getting infections of their heart and their bones and their brains from injecting and the cost associated with being hospitalized and obviously the worst case scenario, the cost of death, <clears throat> we need to kind of be smart about how do we help people not necessarily put themselves at risk. Because even though our overdose rate is going up, the amount of people that, the, the, the rate of increase is still very, very small compared to most other states. Yeah. And I can only say that if yeah. we didn't have this many people in treatment, we mm -hmm. would probably mirror the state of New Hampshire right next to us, with, or Massachusetts, with very large overdose. So even though we have people who are, <clears throat> who are not doing well, we still are doing very well in terms of access to treatment. And so also, how do we just, again, get more people to come into treatment and accept the fact that MAT is often very beneficial? Okay. So the goal would be to have 100% of people yeah. who need it. 
receiving it. Also along those lines, uh, naloxone, yeah. the, uh, the easy availability of naloxone in Vermont, I think the, over the, the, the fatality rate would be much, I much completely higher agree without, with you. It's, pretty, it, it, it's a pretty low barrier to getting naloxone. And in fact, if you come into treatment at the Chittenden Clinic, mm. we have a, pretty much 100% uh, access to naloxone. So if you don't have a kit, you give you, we give you one. Safe Recovery, which is down on Clark Street, does a lot of naloxone kits. And so we really feel like mm -hmm. if you're not in treatment, or even if you're in treatment and you're not using, you should have a kit. So if you have a family, friend, mm -hmm. or whatever goes down, you can revive them. I was yeah. over there today, Grace Keller. Yeah. I have, I have two naloxone kits now. Uh -huh. I carry um, one in my backpack. I mean, you <laughs> just don't know. You go into the bathroom and all of a sudden you see somebody down. Yeah. So, you know, uh, in, in closing, I, I, I want to thank you. You're welcome. I want to thank, thank you for your, for your leadership, uh, for your perseverance over time, <laughs> for your single-minded focus and your innovative mind. And I, I want, I want, I'd like you to close the show today. I'd like you to, 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 to tell the general public, you know, directly, mm -hmm. um, Tell people out there with substance use disorder, just in closing, whatever you want to tell them, John. So I think what we have to recognize, and I think most people know, it's our sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers. I mean, this is a disease that can touch anybody. And, but for the grace of God, you know, I don't have it. I, I've never encountered that. And so if we can move to a place where we're not maligning someone for having developed a substance use disorder of some type and treat that person with, try to help them, cajole them, somehow find their way to recovery, I think that's really where we ought to be going and not being so angry and upset even though we're going to have that reaction. Um, and I think it'll make for a better society overall. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ed. All right.